Okay, so we're going to get started with today's lesson. Um, before we get started, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Riley. I am one of the educators at the Marine Education Center. I've been working here for about a year. Um, I got my degree in marine biology at University of South Alabama. So not at USM, but I do like working with USM. Um, everyone that's that's uh, that I've encountered at USM has been awesome. So um, with me today, I have Lacey who also joined me um, whenever we started our career at the MEC. Yeah, um, so me and Riley started working at the MEC at the same time. Um, I'm an educator also, and I have a degree in marine biology from USM. So I have been involved with Southern Miss for a really long time, and I'm really happy that we get to do this for all of you. Awesome. So today we're going to go over a reptile lesson. So this is one of my favorite lessons. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go just talk about reptiles in general, um, as well as reptiles that we will find in the south or on the coast. And then at 11 o'clock, make sure to come back at 11 and we're going to talk about artifacts. So I'm going to show you all really cool bones. Um, I'm going to show you all some actual snakes that were preserved, as well as I'll have a special guest. One of my pets is actually a reptile. So we'll talk about him a little bit later. All right, so let's show. Okay, so uh, this is a reptile lesson made by Galen and Aaron, also educators at the MEC. So to get started, we're gonna talk about the classification. Reptiles are not the same thing as mammals. They're not the same thing as fish or uh, amphibians or birds. So reptiles are very, very unique. Um, we're gonna start off with the domain. So the domain is eukarya. So all these uh, fancy words, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, those are just ways to classify an organism into a certain group. Um, because like I said before, a reptile is not the same thing as a bird. It's not the same thing as a mammal. Um, so we have to classify them into certain groups. So the domain is eukarya, which means that they have eukaryotic cells. Um, those are basically with any organism um, that's alive, they'll have eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic organisms are going to, typically gonna be um, microorganisms but we're not going to get into those today. Uh, next thing is the kingdom is animalia. So that word is animal. Basically a fancy word for animal. And um, next one we're going to talk about is a phylum chordata. So chordata is basically that they have a, a backbone or they had a backbone at some point in their life. Next one is gonna be reptilia. So this is the class. The class is gonna be reptilia. So now we're gonna zone in on um, the reptiles. So we're only gonna be looking at reptiles today in this class. The characteristics that we're gonna go over through is first of all, they have a vertebral column. So again, that's that they have a backbone. So all of these organisms have backbones right here on my left side. Next one we're gonna talk about is that they mostly lay eggs. So the majority of our reptiles are gonna lay eggs. Um, there are a few exceptions. So sometimes snakes will actually keep the eggs inside of their belly and um, the snakes will hatch inside of their belly and then they'll give live birth. So, um, that's basically to protect their young. So whenever you lay an egg, you have to wait for a while for that egg to form or that organism to form inside that egg and then hatch. So that takes um, a couple of weeks to do that. In that time, we could have other organisms or other animals that are trying to eat those eggs or trying to harm those eggs. So 
the snakes protect it in its belly until they're ready to um, come out into the world. And it's just a, a, a better way to, um, to make sure that they're safe. Kind of like how human moms keep the baby in the belly for nine months to protect it, to nourish it, um, make sure that everything is okay. So it's a really interesting process that only a few species of snakes do. Next thing is that they have lungs. So the third thing is that they have lungs. Um, all our reptiles have lungs, including our alligators, crocodiles that you see in the water a lot of the time. Um, our sea turtles, so our sea turtles have to come up for air every 30 minutes to two hours, depending on the species. So these guys you'll see in the water, but they still have to come up for air. The fourth thing is that they're ectothermic, ectothermic. So this is a fancy word for um, cold blooded, ectothermic. The opposite of that would be endothermic and that would be warm blooded creatures. So ecto meaning outside temperature, so ectothermic and endothermic meaning inside temperature. So um, we're gonna talk about that a little bit because whenever I was growing up, I thought that um, warm blooded creatures just had warm blood and cold blooded creatures had cold blood, but that's not necessarily 100% true. So um, with our warm blooded creatures, our inside temperature, so mammals and humans are warm blooded creatures. So our inside temperature stays at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 98 degrees Fahrenheit, that's something that all humans have in common. Um, doesn't matter uh, how old you are, you can be one year old, or you can be 80 years old, um, and we'll, we'll all have that in common. We'll have 98 degrees Fahrenheit in our body. So it doesn't matter if we're in a cold environment or a hot environment, our inside temperature will typically stay the same. When you go to 100 degrees, so only two degrees difference, that's typically when you start to get a fever, um, you get sick, you know, you start to sweat. Um, and, you know, that's when your mom takes your temperature and you're like, oh, you're over 100 and, you know, you have to take some medicine for that. Um, so only two degrees difference will mean the dif the dif will be the difference between you being healthy and you being sick. With our cold blooded creatures, the inside temperature will depend on the temperature around them. So what I mean by that is if I'm a reptile, right? And I'm in a, in a room and that room is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That means the inside temperature of my body would be 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So if they're in a really hot environment, um, or it's like 90, 90 degrees, 100 degrees plus, um, the inside temperature of those reptiles will also be 90 degrees or 100 degrees plus. The same thing whenever it drops down to, you know, 30 degrees. Um, if I'm out in a really cold environment, my inside temperature is also going to be 30 degrees or whatever um, temperature is outside. And that's typically when your reptiles start to slow down because the inside temperature of their bodies are so cold. Usually when you're out in the snow, you kind of like, you know, you don't, you're not as agile and as fast as you would be in a hotter temperature. Um, so now you know the difference between cold blooded and warm blooded. So ectothermic versus endothermic. And the last characteristic is that they have scales or a bony external plate. So I see, uh, is this Latin? Yes, so the um, classifications, those are, those are Latin words. Awesome. So we're gonna talk about this very briefly. Um, so snakes and lizards go through genotypic determination. So basically um, that's how humans uh, work as well. So um, a male and a female basically decide if you're a boy or a girl. Not going to get into that too much. Um, but we 
we are going to get into temperature dependent determination. So this is really fascinating. Um, so basically, um, we're going to talk about our alligators and crocodiles. So whenever alligators and crocodiles lay their eggs, um, the temperature around those eggs are going to determine whether they're going to be born female or male. So that's really interesting because you don't really see that a lot in the animal world. Um, almost, you can almost compare it to being cold blooded a little bit. So um, on really warm temperatures, we're going to see a lot more males being born. Really cold temperatures, we're going to see a lot more females being born. So um, typically on hot summer days, um, we're going to see a lot of alligators and crocodiles being born as males. And, you know, early spring, late summer, late fall, we're going to see a lot more females being born. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a, um, an hourglass. So it doesn't go back and forth. They don't go back and forth being male, and female, male, and female until they're born, until they hatch. There's kind of like a, a, a timer. And once that timer's up, um, if they're on the, uh, on the male side, then they're going to stay a male until they're born. Okay. Um, so it kind of just stops at a certain time after a few weeks. And that's how they determine whether they're boys or girls. So it's really interesting because again, you don't see that a lot in the animal world. Next thing we're going to talk about is our turtles. So our turtles, it's the opposite. So colder temperatures are going to be males. Warmer temperatures are going to be females. Okay, so something interesting that's happening nowadays is, so first of all, um, turtles, they, they come out of water and they lay their eggs in the sand. Um, they dig a hole that's about two to three feet deep. So that's as, uh, um, almost as tall as you guys. So imagine a hole your height. Um, turtles can dig that far deep. And whenever you're digging in the sand, usually the deeper you go, the colder and the wetter it is. So it's not going to be super hot the more you dig down into, into the sand because it's really uh, wet from the water. Um, versus the top of the sand, if you've been there on a hot summer day, you know, sometimes you have to wear sandals on the sand because it's so hot, it burns your feet. So what you'll typically find is that females are going to be born at the top of the nest and males are going to be born at the bottom of the nest. But what we're seeing nowadays because uh, of global warming being one of the reasons as well as just uh, hotter temperatures for a longer amount of time throughout the day is that that whole nest is heating up. So even the, the eggs at the bottom of the nest are heating up so much that um, we're having a skewer. So now we're having more females than males. It's about a 70-30% ratio, um, which is very, very significant. That's a very um, huge shift. Um, so we're having a lot more females being born. So you would think that having fem a lot of females would be a good thing, right? Because females can have babies and um, you know, more babies means more baby turtles. But in fact, it's a lot harder for these uh, female turtles to actually find a mate, you know, someone they can fall in love with and, you know, have babies with. It's a lot harder for them to do that. They can go 20 plus years and not find a single male turtle just because there's less of them. So they're more rare. Uh, so if we compare our turtles, so there's 70% females, 30% males to humans. Right now in the human population in the whole world, there's about 51% females and 49% uh, males. So it's about even. That's because of the genotypic determination. But because temperature dependent determination is a lot more, um, I guess, uh, at random. It depends on the temperature we're getting this here in data. So um, if you have any questions about this, this is probably the most confusing part of the whole lesson, just because there's, it's just, you know, it's new to a lot of people and not everyone um, gets it off, 
you know, uh, gets it right away. So if you have any questions about this so far, you can go ahead and ask that. And I'll get to the questions at the very end. So I'm going to get through my lesson as quick as possible. Um, so I can, uh, you know, answer all your questions and make sure that you get everything out of the presentation. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is our alligators versus crocodiles. We're going to talk about these guys because they look, you know, they look pretty much the same. So I'll show you this slide. You probably won't know which one's which, you know, right off the bat, unless, you know, you studied this before. So we're going to compare these two guys and talk about with our alligators, we're going to have a wide U-shaped snout. So what I mean by that, it's gonna be like that. It's gonna look like a really soft edges, you know, a U or a C-shaped, really soft edges. With our crocodiles though, we're gonna have a V-shaped snout. So their snouts are gonna look like that. So a U-shaped and a V-shaped. So that's the first thing Whenever you're looking at an alligator or a crocodile, um, typically what you're going to see is that their head is going to be above water. So this is probably going to be the first characteristic that you can point out. Next thing is that whenever they have their mouths closed, so whenever they, you know, they don't have it wide open, um, alligators are going to have their teeth hidden. So you're only going to be able to find just a few teeth on the top part of their snout coming down. So just like maybe two or three teeth at the front of their snout and they're going to be coming down. With our crocodiles though, we're going to have teeth going all through the side of their, uh, of their mouths going down and at the bottom part of their jaw, they're going to be coming up. It's going to look like barbed wire. It's going to look very menacing, very uh, ferocious looking. So you're going to see all their teeth with crocodiles. Our alligators are going to prefer brackish water or fresh water. So for those who don't know what brackish water, that's a mixture of salt and fresh water. So you're typically going to find um, brackish water uh, close to the coast because we're getting lots of salty water from um, the Gulf of Mexico. For us in Mississippi, we're going to get a lot of salt water from the Gulf of Mexico. And we're also going to get lots of fresh water coming from up north from all the rivers and streams. And whenever they meet, so um, at the Davis Bayou right next to um, uh, right next to the Gulf of Mexico, we're going to get lots of brackish water because we're getting lots of fresh and salt water. And we have certain organisms that like that prefer that brackish water. So alligators are going to prefer that or fresh water. You can find them all over the South, even up to North Carolina, I've heard. And our crocodiles are going to prefer salt water. Next thing we're going to talk about is that alligators are commonly found in the US, United States, and in China. And our native, um, our crocodiles are native to Africa. So um, crocodiles are from Africa, but they are also found in Florida, which is kind of crazy to think of. How did they get to the United States? So um, the, the biggest theory is that someone brought them over to the United States. Um, you know, this was before TSA was a thing, um, you know, the airport security. And you could easily bring anything you wanted to. If you wanted to bring a whole piece of cake, you could bring a cake and no one would care. Um, so this guy decided to bring back some baby crocodiles and, um, and he basically raised them. So he might have brought them as eggs. He might have brought them as, you know, little baby uh, crocodiles. And as when they're small, they look really cool. I mean, they look like little tiny dinosaurs. Like I would personally want one. Um, but what he probably didn't know or what he probably didn't care about was that these guys can get really, really big. They can get up to 20 feet in length. Um, so that's huge. And, you know, once they're older, they're going to be eating everything in their way. Um, so this guy probably had it in his house and it was like, 
eating all his couches and, you know, destroying the place, probably trying to eat his, his dogs and cats. So um, him being close to the Everglades, he realized, well, you know, the alligators are, are, uh, you know, they're found in the Everglades. So this will be no big deal if I release them. They're the same thing, they're the same thing. Um, so he released the, his crocodiles into the Everglades. And now we have a whole crocodile population um, living with our alligator population in the Everglades. So that's really interesting because you don't really see that or hear that every day. Um, so the next thing we're gonna look at is alligators are smaller, but with that being said, they're faster. So they have less weight to carry. So they're a lot faster. And then our crocodiles are larger, but they're a lot slower because again, they have more weight to carry. And then the last one is that the alligators are less aggressive and our crocodiles are more aggressive. So what we got to think about is where these animals are found. So our alligators are found in typically your rivers and streams, um, your lakes, bayous, places like that. And if you've ever gone fishing, the first place you go to is, you know, if it's not the ocean, it's rivers and lakes and streams and bayous. So there's lots of fish, there's lots of organisms swimming around. Um, so there's always a meal, there's always food for these alligators. Um, if an alligator wanted to, you know, he's like, oh, I'm hungry, I'm gonna go get some food. He could probably get it within a few hours. It'd be a piece of cake for him. Um, versus our crocodiles are gonna be more aggressive. So crocodiles, um, like I said, they're native to Africa, which over there, there's a limited food supply and they're also gonna be competing against animals that are bigger than them animals that are faster than them and animals that are stronger than them. So they have a huge, tough competition. Um, you know, our alligators, they're, they're pretty much the top dog in these uh, lakes and rivers. You know, they, they're probably the biggest organism um, besides the bull shark, but that's not in, you won't find a bull shark all that much. And if you do, they're typically just a little baby bull shark. So our alligators are top dog um, in the United States in rivers and streams. But crocodiles, they're not on the top of the food chain. So they, um, so they have to act aggressive. They have to hunt for their food. If a crocodile is hungry, it'll probably take them not a few hours, but it'll probably take them a few days to catch his next meal. So, um, and again, you'll find these in water sources, which water sources are not that common um, in the hot heat of Africa. So Again, there's limited places where they can eat, there's less food where they can eat, and they're competing against really strong, fast animals. So they have to actively hunt for the food. They see food, they're gonna go for it. They're gonna go and try to eat it. Um, they're not gonna wait around because they don't have that luxury. So um, our crocodiles are more uh, aggressive because of that, and then our alligators are more territorial. So. If you do see an alligator, the chances are they're probably not going to bother you. Like if you're on a boat and you're, or you're kayaking, you know, you're, they're not going to bother you as long as you keep your space. So you get too close to them, they're probably going to get really aggressive and they're going to stand their ground. It's kind of like if someone came into your house and you didn't know them, you'd be defensive, be like, who are you? Please leave, get out of here. Um, so our alligators are going to be like that. And then at the 11 o'clock session, I'm gonna show y'all a really cool alligator skull. Um, and we're gonna talk more about the characteristics and all that cool stuff. We're gonna see where the brain goes and um, stuff like that. So make sure to come back at 11. All right, so now that we've talked about um, alligators versus crocodiles, we're gonna ask y'all a poll question. So Lacey, we're gonna skip that first poll. Um, we're gonna go straight to the difference between alligators and crocodiles. Thank you, awesome. So is the image on the right, on the top right, an alligator or a crocodile? So you guys just answer this the best you can based off of 
what we talked about in the last slide. And for the people on Facebook, um, they can type their answer in the comments too. And I will be looking out for those. Yeah, awesome. That'd be great. Yeah, if you're on Facebook, um, just type in whatever you think is on the top right, whether it's alligator or a crocodile. If you don't know, it's okay. Um, okay, so right now we have um, a few people chose alligators and a few people chose crocodiles. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this real quick. Let's move this to the side. So um, those who chose crocodiles, you guys are absolutely right. And uh, so it's a little bit hard to see, but we gotta look at the characteristics that we talked about. So the first one we talked about was the shape of their head. So if we look at this guy right here on the left side, he has a V-shaped snout. So it looks exactly like a V. Um, <clears throat> you have a really pointy snout. If you look at the top one, so the guy at the very top, also a V-shaped snout, looks just like that. That's the first thing you're gonna notice whenever you're looking at these guys is um, the shape of their head. Second thing we're gonna look at is this guy on the right, on the far right, he has his mouth closed, but you can see all the teeth. So you can see all the teeth coming up, all the teeth coming down on both sides. Um, really pointy, you know, it looks really menacing. You know, I, it's kind of like a, a dinosaur almost, it looks like a dinosaur. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the image on the left hand side. So now we're gonna ask y'all another poll question. And again, this could be, they could both be um, crocodiles. This one could be an alligator or a crocodile. So just look at the characteristics that we talked about and you guys are gonna make your best guess. Awesome, so you guys are now 100% right. Um, so everyone chose an alligator. So we're gonna talk about that quickly. Um, so again, if you're looking at these two, um, these two pictures, you can't really tell them apart without looking at the, first of all, the shape of their head. So we're looking at this guy on the bottom and he's, he has a U-shaped snout. So it's not gonna be pointy compared to the ones on the right. So I want you to look at both sides. So it's gonna be a U or a C-shaped snout. Second thing is that you can't, this guy right here in the front, you can't see his teeth. So you can only see his teeth, again, at the very front of their snout and just a few teeth coming down. So um, it's kind of like they're hidden under all his chubby cheeks. So those chubby cheeks are hiding all those teeth and you can't, um, you can't see them. And if you think about it, our alligators are gonna be, their heads are gonna be a little bigger, a little wider. Um, so again, those are the differences that you can spot. So if you ever go to the Everglades and you know, you're on a, 
on a boat and your tour guide's like, oh, so over there on your left, we have a special friend and you can be the first one to be like, oh, that's an alligator or, oh, that's a crocodile. So now you can spot the differences. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is our snakes. So we're gonna talk about our venomous snakes versus our non-venomous snakes. So in this picture on the bottom left, the green snake, that is an example of a venomous snake. The picture right next to it on the uh, right side is going to be an example of a non-venomous snake. So whenever I'm talking about the characteristics, I want you guys to look back at these two snakes. So with our venomous snakes, they're going to have a triangle shaped head, almost like a V-shaped head, right? So if you look at it, the top of their head is gonna be really, really wide. And then it gets narrow towards the snout. So where the, the nose and mouth is. Another characteristic is that they have heat sensing pits below their eyes. It's gonna be a little dot below their eye and basically they're able to pick up on thermal radiation a lot better. Um, a fun fact is that snakes actually don't like cold food. They have to be, it has to be warm or it has to be hot. So um, again, what we talked about with mammals, these guys are eating, you know, rodents and other creatures. But what we talked about mammals is that we're warm blooded creatures. So the inside temperature, again, is really, really hot. So when we're alive, we're really hot inside. So these guys can sense that. But if an animal is dead, um, their body gets cold. So what they've learned over time, and this is really cool with snakes, is that what they've learned over time is that cold, if, if an animal is um, dead, their body is cold, right? But if nothing ate it, then something must have happened to that animal. So if it, there's an animal and it's just laying there and it doesn't have any like, you know, nothing else try to eat it or anything like that, it means that it died from natural causes. So the majority of the time is that these animals had a disease. So they might've died from cancer. They might've died from, um, you know, I don't know, salmonella. They might've died from coronavirus. You know, they might've died from any of those diseases. And they want to avoid that. So they do not want to eat it. That's kind of like if I offered you a nice chicken tender that came straight from the oven and you know it's really, really good and you've had it before versus a chicken tender that fell on the floor and might have caught, you know, salmonella or might have caught some bacteria. Um, I personally would like the hot chicken tender that was, you know, fresh and out of the oven versus the one that fell on the floor and probably has diseases on it. So these guys have learned over time that hot food is good food. Next thing we're gonna look at is the pupils have a slit in their eyes. So their eyes look like cat eyes. Have you ever seen a cat? They have that long pierce or that long slit in their eye. Um, just like this little guy down here has that black slit in the middle of its eye. And then venomous snakes have fangs. So fangs, that's where the venom comes out of. Um, another thing I want you guys to notice is that I've been using the word venom and not poison. So venom is anything that can be injected into you, whether it's like a, you know, bee sting or um, a snake biting you, anything that enters your body through the skin. But poison is anything that is ingested, whether you drink it or you eat it, that is poison. So now you know the difference between that. So there's no such thing as a poisonous snake. It's only a venomous snake. Um, so if you, I assume that if you drink venom, then then it's considered poison. Uh, that's what I assume. So now you know the difference between venom and poison. So the last um, little bullet point we'll get to the, at the end. Um, now we're gonna talk about our non-venomous snakes. So our non-venomous snakes are gonna have rounded heads. So it's gonna be really smooth edges. Typically that's what their, their heads are gonna look like. Um, so really smooth edges, not pointy like that. 
they are not going to have that heat sensing pit. Um, so they're not going to have that really cool ability. They'll still be able to pick up on the difference between warm, warm and cold food. Um, but they're not going to have, it's got, they're not going to have that extra, um, uh, I guess like ability or that extra, um, oomph, extra, um, power for that. Next thing we're going to look at is that they have round pupils. So if you look at this little guy, they look like normal eyes compared to the guy on the left. Um, their pupils are going to look normal, really round, just like any other animal. And then our non-venomous snakes are not going to have fangs. So all snakes have teeth, but only venomous snakes have fangs. Um, so that's really interesting. And then the last thing we're gonna talk about is the scales on their tail. So before we even get to that, snakes have a head, they have a body and they have a tail. So it's not a head, and a body, and it's not a head and a tail, a really long tail. It's a head, body, and tail. So where the body is, that's where all the vital organs are in. So that's where the lungs and the heart, the stomach, and you know all those organs are at, all the organs that the snake needs to live. Um, everything under that, so the tail is basically just gonna be you know muscle, bones and skin so it's not going to have any vital organs on the tail so um there there have been cases where people you know try to cut a snake because they felt threatened and they just cut off the tail and the snake was still alive because you didn't cut any of the vital organs so um snakes have tails body and head so now that we can have that covered we're gonna look at the image on the bottom right. And right here to the left is going to be the body. And from here to the right is going to be the tail. So you can see that the right side, they're gonna have different um, scale patterns. So for the non-venomous snakes, they're gonna have staggered plates or staggered scales going down the tail. But with our venomous snakes, they're going to have single plates back to back to back to back in a single filed line um, on the bottom side of the tail. So this is probably the last characteristic that you're gonna look at for the snake because you would have to pick it up. I do not recommend or advise you to pick up any snakes. If you see any snakes, whether they're venomous or non-venomous, they can still be a threat um, and, you know, even our non-venomous snakes could have, you know, they could have diseases and um, they could still hurt you. So I recommend if you see a snake, just avoid it, tell your parents. Um, so, you know, some, you know, they can deal with it. <laughs> so they can call someone to come get it or, um, you know, just avoid it or do something about it. So again, don't pick up any snakes. Okay, so these are examples of what we just talked about, just a diagram version. Oops, I had a mess. Diagram version of what I just talked about, our venomous snakes and all the characteristics, and then our non-venomous snakes and all that. So again, the color patterns um, can be a lot alike. So you can have a non-venomous snake that's super bright in color, um, but it's not as threatening as a venomous snake. And we can have venomous snakes that are you know, really dull brown, black, grayish snakes that don't look venomous, but they actually are. So you can't really judge a snake based off its color. All right. So the last thing we're gonna talk about is our turtles. So with our, sea, uh, our turtles, we have sea turtles, terrapins, and tortoises. So these are all considered turtles. So what are the differences? So we're gonna talk about our sea turtles first. So this is an example of a sea turtle, this little guy right here with his mouth wide open. Um, so our sea turtles are ocean dwellers. And they eat sea, right? um, so you'll find them in the ocean all over the world. They'll have flippers, so they don't really need fingers or toes or anything like that because they're not walking on land. 
Um, the only time they come out of land is they go onto the sand to um, lay their eggs. Or I've seen in some cases, whenever I lived in Hawaii, they would just come out just to chill, I guess sunbathe. Um, so they don't need fingers or feet or anything like that. They just have flippers. Their shells are flat and streamlined. So what I mean by that is that compared to a tortoise, their shells are a lot more flat. And that's so that they are more hydrodynamic in the water so they can swim faster. Um, so a disadvantage that these guys have is that they cannot retract into their shell. So whenever they're scared, they can't do this and hide like our tortoises and our terrapins can. So they can't hide, their limbs are exposed at all times. So it's really, um, it's, uh, it's a really easy target for predators. So for sharks, um, the shark just has to bite off one flipper. And at that point, this, the, um, the sea turtle won't be able to swim away. So these guys are really easily um, attacked by any predator out in the ocean. That's why the survival rate of sea turtles is only 1%, unfortunately. So it's kind of sad to think about that only 1% of our sea turtles make it to full adulthood and, you know, can mate. Um, so um, these guys are endangered. So again, they have lots of predators on them. They have pollution endangering them. And they also have um, uh, fishermen. So a, a lot of the time, it's not on purpose. So fishermen will do long trawls where they pull a net with a boat and sometimes they'll catch turtles. It's, it's all by accident. They don't mean to catch um, turtles, but it does happen. Um, and then in other cases, we have poachers, which are uh, people that actively hunt sea turtles knowing that it's illegal. So these guys are the ones we don't like. We don't like the ones that are actively looking for sea turtles for their meat or for their shells or anything like that. So they have a lot of things against them. And it's kind of sad because sea turtles are the most peaceful creatures out there. Um, whenever I lived in Hawaii, you could just swim with sea turtles and they wouldn't bother you. As long as you weren't like pulling them or touching them or anything like that. I mean, you could snorkel right with them. You could scuba dive with them. Um, so they're so they're peaceful creatures. And it's kind of sad that they're, you know, they're endangered. Um, the next guy we're going to talk about is our tortoises. So we have sea and now we have tortoises. So tortoises are found on land. Um, please don't ever pick up a tortoise and put it in the water because chances are it's probably gonna drown. It's gonna be too slow to get out of the water or it won't be able to swim out and it'll basically drown. So again, all these um, creatures have lungs. Um, our tortoises have toes. So if you look at the bottom right image, this is an example of um, tortoise toes or tortoise feet. And these guys are gonna have a bulky, rigid shell. So um, the closest thing I can compare it to is if you've ever seen SpongeBob and you know where Patrick lives, Patrick Starr, um, you know how he lives in a giant dome rock. That's basically what a tortoise shell looks like. So it's really large and it looks like a giant boulder. And then these guys, since there's so much space in their shell, they can retract into their shell. So they can hide whenever they're, um, you know, something's threatening them. And most of the time they'll just leave them alone or they won't even notice them. So the predators won't even notice them. And then the last thing we're gonna talk about is our terrapins. So we have sea turtles that live in the ocean and we have tortoises that live on land. And in the middle, we have terrapins. So terrapins have the best of both worlds in my opinion. Um, these guys are freshwater turtles, so you won't see terrapins out in the ocean. Not common at all. Um, these guys are going to have the flippers, like a mix between flippers and feet. Um, and they'll have claws. So if you look on the top left, you're going to see that these guys have, um, it's like a, a mixture between our tortoises and our sea tortoises, our, our tortoises and our sea turtles. Sorry about that. Um, these guys are also going to have a flat shell like our sea turtles, um, so that they, that way they can swim faster and they are able to retract into the shell, just like our tortoises. So again, they can walk on land, they can swim, they can hide in their shell. 
Um, so they have the best of both worlds. These guys are the most common turtles that you're going to find, um, you know, in the south. So what I mean by that is our little box turtles. So our box turtles are going to be found all over the south. Um, anywhere there's a river or stream, you're probably going to find one of these little guys. You'll see them crossing the road a lot of the times. People will get up, um, will get out of the car and, you know, move them along um, the road. And they're native to the U.S. and Mexico. These guys are omnivores. So they eat about 70% of that are veggies. So they'll eat plants, they'll eat flowers. They really do like flowers. Um, and the other 30% will be protein or minerals. So um, they'll eat insects. So these guys really like insects, um, mealworms, beetles, stuff like that. And um, we do have two box turtles at the MEC. They're, they stay there full time. Right now, because of Corona, they're staying with um, a few people that work at the MEC. And they're taking really good care of them. But um, the reason why we have them is because, unfortunately, they got hit by a car or they got hit by a lawnmower or something happened that they broke their shell. So they broke their shell and um, basically we've been taking care of them ever since. If we release them back into the wild, then chances are that their um, organisms would start to eat. Um, eat past that crack like ants or any other microorganism and basically um, hurt these turtles. So if we release them into the wild, they'd probably last a month. And then after that, I don't think they would make it longer than that. Um, so we take really good care of them. I'll talk about them more in my um, artifact lesson at 11 o'clock. Um, another example of terrapins, so box turtles or terrapins. Another example would be soft shell terrapins or alligator snapping turtles. Um, well, again, we'll get into that at the 11 o'clock session. So make sure to come back at 11 o'clock. So now we're gonna answer questions. I see a few, let's see. Boo, poachers, boo. <laughs> wow, that's like the funniest thing I've seen all day, all week actually. Boo poachers. <laughs> yeah, we don't like poachers. You know, they're they're not only harming um, sea turtles, they're harming elephants for their tusks. Um, they're harming rhinos for their horns, um, lions. I mean, it's just, I don't see the point in it. You know, they're already endangered. They're not gonna be here in a few years if they keep on getting poached. So there's just no reason for it. Okay. Okay, so do sometimes alligators try to eat their own babies or eggs? Um, I'm not 100% sure. I, I doubt that they do. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure they don't. Um, you know, they have plenty of food out in the rivers um, and the bayous that they wouldn't really eat their eggs. So why do snakes hiss? So um, Easiest way I can answer that is that everyone's throat is a little bit differently. That's why I sound differently than you or your parents or anyone else you know. And that's the way our throat is constructed. So the, the way that snakes' throats are constructed is so they make a hissing sound. So you will never see a snake talk to you or bark or call like a bird or any of those things. That's just the way they, that they're... Um, their throats are constructed. Okay, how rare is it to see a spotted turtle? So if you're talking about a box turtle, um, it's pretty rare. I've never personally seen one and I've spent a lot of my time um, out on lakes and out on uh, in the forest and stuff like that. And I've never actually seen a spotted turtle so it might just be the region that we're in. They might not be as common in the South than there are in other parts of Mexico and United States. Awesome, so I really enjoy the, the questions um, that you guys are getting back. 
If you guys have any more questions, I'll wait for a few more minutes. Go ahead and put it in the question and answer box and then I'll get to it. You can type in anything. Um, it can be about reptiles. It can be something that we learned yesterday in the bird lesson that I didn't get to um, or you didn't understand. Um, anything about marine biology that you weren't sure of. So while we're waiting for um, those things, um, so I have a tortoise. So I have a baby tortoise. Um, he's about, I think he's like right out of year. And um, he's super small. I mean, he's about this big. And I will show him off at the, um, at the next lesson at 11. So make sure you can, you can come back so that way I can show you all my tortoise. He's really cool. He's super cute. I mean, he, he's like, you can just hold him in your hand and he just walks or you can take him anywhere. We brought him to um, restaurants and we keep him like in a little box. Um, so he's super chill. Uh, right now we're raising him inside uh, because he's too small. And then eventually we're going to release him to our yard. So he has plenty of space to run around um, and do all those cool things. So are dinos considered reptiles? So um, my, my hypothesis is that um, when dinosaurs were a thing, they basically split up into two groups. They split up into birds and reptiles. Um, so what I mean by that is that now scientists and archeologists and all these people that are digging up bones have basically concluded that dinosaurs actually had feathers or a lot of dinosaurs had feathers and they had a lot of characteristics that our birds have. So they had the talons, they had um, feathers, um, some dinosaurs had beaks. Um, so they had characteristics that both resembled reptiles and resembled birds. So my hypothesis is that they derived um, or birds and reptiles derived from dinosaurs? So that's a really good question. Why do turtles have markings? So a lot of the time, um, it's, uh, it's at random. So um, kind of like how I have a mole right here and I have a mole right here and a mole over here. Um, so a lot of the time it'll just be just you know, how they're born, they'll have really interesting and unique markings, kind of like your fingerprints, how everyone has a different um, fingerprint. Um, other times is that the males will have really bright shells, so that way they can attract the females. So that way, you know, they can spot them and be like, oh, that's, you know, that's someone I can fall in love with and have babies. So uh, that's the other reason why. Um, again, another one it just might have been ge genetic mutations. So over time, you know, it might have just been one turtle, but then that turtle moved to the north. And then in the north, it, they would have had more camouflage if they, you know, had a different type of shell. And then over a couple of years, their shell started to um, adapt to those areas. So that's why. The Western, if you look at the Western box turtle versus the Eastern box turtle, they have really, they have similar shells, but they have different um, patterns. Okay, let's see. Is there a reason why crocodiles have different eggs depending on the heat? So they have the same egg, so they're releasing the egg, but the temperature around them will determine whether they're boys or girls. So it's really, really unique. Again, not a lot of organisms um, actually do that. Again, it's, it's more of the genotypic determination, not the temperature dependent determination. How many species of crocodiles are there? Um, I'm honestly not sure. I'm pretty sure it's just one species. Um, but again, yes. Uh looked it up because I was super curious about the answer. There are actually 13 different species of crocodiles. Awesome. So you've so, got saltwater, the Nile crocodile, there's also a freshwater crocodile. There's lots of different types actually and I didn't know that. 
I didn't know that either. So yeah, a lot of the questions you guys are ans- um, asking me, um, some I might not, not know the answer to. And, uh, you know, especially when I'm working at the MEC, you know, kids are constantly asking us questions like all the time. I mean, it could be about school. It could be about marine biology. I mean, it could be about like the dirt that we're walking on. And um, a lot of the time I don't know the answers to them. And I always either ask my other educators or the other um, marine educators that work with me. And, you know, we always talk about these things. We always, you know, Lacey and Galen might not, might know something that I don't know. And I might know something that they don't know. And we always um, communicating and learning from each other. If we don't know the answer, then we resort to Google and we know we look it up and um, because we're we're curious, you know, we're scientists. We're always trying to find the answer. We're always trying to find out um, why something does something or, you know, like, why does an organism eat that? Or why does an organism live there? Or why do these organisms like to live together? Um, So even if we don't know the answer, we always try to find the answer some way, shape or form. So I love hearing answers or questions from you guys because I actually learn from you guys. So um, right now, I think we've hit the time. So again, make sure to come back at 11. So an hour from now, um, and I will show you all really cool artifacts. I'll show you all my tortoise. I'll show you all some actual snakes, some skulls, some bones, some really cool things. So make sure to tune in back at 11. So I see that the majority of you guys, I think all of you guys were in the, uh, um, the lesson this morning. So that's good because we're gonna go over everything we learned about reptiles, but I'm actually gonna show you really cool artifacts and um, you know just everything we talked about, just so you can visualize what I was saying. So my name is Riley. I'm one of the marine educators at the MEC. And with me, I have Lacey. Yeah, so I'm also an educator at the Marine Education Center. Um, Riley and I started at the same time. So we've been um, going through this together and it's been really fun. And um, we're really excited for the 11 a.m. session. today. Cool. All right, so uh, I'm gonna get the first artifacts. I'll be right back. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna look at is this jaw. So this is the bottom part of an alligator jaw. See how big it is compared to my head. So you don't wanna be close to these guys because they have a really strong bite. Um, So this hole right here, I can stick my hand through, as well as these chambers going down its jaw that's embedded with muscle. So there's lots of muscle in the jaw portion of these um, alligators. They have really long, sharp teeth. These are kind of dulled down a little bit over time. You can see how big they are compared to my finger. So super sharp, you don't wanna mess with these guys. Um, This is a full size alligator jaw. So they can come smaller but this is full size. Next thing we're gonna look at is this heavy guy right here. This is an actual, I can grab it, right? This is an actual alligator skull. Super big, again, compare it to my head. It's not something you wanna mess with. Um, So I'm gonna let you guys see it. And then we'll talk a little bit about it. So this is the back side. This is where the body connects. Inside, all this embedded with muscle. We are m- missing a few teeth because um, over time they've just fallen out. Um, you know, little kids tend to grab it or you know pull it off. Um, without knowing that it's just glued on. So they kind of just fall apart easily. 
All right, so now let's talk about this guy. So the first thing we notice is this is where the brain goes. So right here in that little hole, you can barely fit your finger in it. That's where the brain goes. So um, our alligators, as well as reptiles in general, have really small brains. They're instinctual animals, which means that they're born knowing what to do. So with humans, our parents teach us what to do. Um, you know, we go to school to learn about English, so how to speak and how to use the English language, um, how to do math, um, everything science related, you know. So we're taught what to do, but with our reptiles, our alligators, crocodiles, sea turtles, all those, they're born with that already implanted in their heads. So they know how to hunt, they know um, what to eat, you know, they don't go out and be like, hmm, I'm gonna try some leaves today and see how that tastes. No, they already know that they're gonna like meat, that they're carnivores. Um, they're gonna know uh, where to go, where to put their eggs. They're, they're just gonna know all those things. So they don't really need a lot of brain power to you know, solve a math equation or they don't need to decide what they're gonna wear today. Um, they don't need to know how to cook or all these things that humans do. They don't know how to talk. Um, so yeah, they're already, know, they're already born with knowing what to do. Next thing I want you guys to notice is, so right here, these are where the eyes go. So these are two eye holes, okay? So if you're looking at it, this is what you're gonna see when, you're, when it's skimming above the water. The only thing you're gonna see is this head portion right here. Um, these are the nostrils right here. And you can see this is the U-shaped snout I was talking about earlier this morning. So U-shaped snout for alligators. A V-shaped snout would kind of like come down and cut this way, come down and cut that way, and that would be your crocodile. With this one, you can see very clearly that this is a U-shaped or a C-shaped snout. Um, another thing that we've um, understood over time is that scientists have collected a lot of data from alligators and crocodiles. We have them. They're plentiful down here in the south, so it's really easy to find these guys and tag them and you know, uh, do measurements and weigh them and all these crazy things. So what they've noticed over time with all their data is that from the top part of their snout or their, uh, their, um, their nose where they breathe, to the bottom part of their eye socket, this one is about 13 inches. So 13 inches from here all the way to here. So they've been able to uh, collect so much data that this measurement gets converted to feet. So 13 inches gets converted to 13 feet, which means that this guy was 13 feet long, just based off of the measurements from here to here. Compared to this guy, it's a lot smaller. So the measurement from here, the top of their nostrils to the bottom part of their eyes, that's about three inches. So this guy was probably just three feet. Um, so again, whenever you see these guys, if you're ever out fishing in the lake or in the bayou, that's the first thing you're gonna notice. If you see something like this, super small, you can kind of see that that's not really that long. It's about a finger length. Um, so you know that that alligator is not that big. So there's not much to worry about. But if you see this coming across the water, you can see that that's, I mean, that's almost a forearm length, at least my forearm. So you know that's going to be a big body under that water. So you want to avoid at all costs, you know, swim away get away from that area because you don't want to um, mess around with the alligators, especially if you're going into their home. Okay, so 
Uh, next thing we're gonna talk about is our snakes. So I'm gonna show you three types of organisms here. And you guys are gonna tell me whether they're venomous snakes, non-venomous snakes, and we're gonna look at all the characteristics. So this is our first one. There's always a glare on my camera, so it's kind of hard to see. So that is the head of the snake. There we go. So everyone see that head right there? Now we're gonna look at the tail. barely see it. it's kind of hard to see it in this water it's already kind of murky but i will give you all a hint um the scales are staggered okay so the scales are staggered on the bottom side of the tail so i'll let you look at the head one more time right there you see it on the top Really cool looking. This guy's not too big, but again, you can't base um, a snake based on their size or color, whether venomous or non-venomous. Okay, so now we're gonna ask a poll question. The first poll question. Is this a venomous snake or a non-venomous snake? So I posted um, the slides that we talked about earlier so you guys can see um, the characteristics between each one. I'll show you all again. That's the top of the head right there. And the underside where the scales are staggered on the bottom part of the tail. So go ahead and post your answers. Okay, awesome. So the majority of you guys post that it is non-venomous. So you're absolutely right. Um, the eyes are circular the uh, bottom part of the tail is staggered. So the scales are staggered. There's two rows, just like the bottom part of this image right here. And they have rounded heads. So it's not really a triangle shaped head. Um, so we know with all those characteristics that that is a non-venomous snake. So this one, I'm gonna let you guys try to figure out what type of snake this is. So in the chat box, put if you know what type of snake this is. So these are common snakes that you find down here um, in the south. They'll be like in your grass and stuff or in the forest. If you know the name to this snake, go ahead and put it in the chat. So um, sometimes they ask us, like, did we collect these snakes? No, we didn't go out and collect these snakes. Um, they were donated to us. We did not um, go and kill these snakes. So if you know what type of snake that is, go ahead and put it in the box. I'll give you all a, a hint. It has gray in the name, so gray like the color gray. All right, so this guy right here is a gray ribbon snake. A gray ribbon snake. So they don't get much bigger than this. Um, they're pretty small guys, but again, 
Um, you can't base a snake, whether they're venomous or non-venomous. Hey guys, um, Riley computer just went a little crazy on him. So give him just a little bit and he will be back up to show you all the other snakes and really cool artifacts that we have at the MEC. So he is currently at the MEC right now. Um, so just give him a couple minutes and he'll be back up and things will be back to normal. Um, while he is coming back, if you guys want to talk about snakes in the comments, then you can totally chat amongst yourselves. You can ask me questions um, while we wait for Riley. Oh, there he is. That wasn't long at all. You're muted, bud. Riley, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, my computer shut off. I'm not sure why because uh, it's fully charged, but who knows? Okay, so now we're gonna get to the next, uh, the next snake. Thank you, Lacey, for covering me. So this guy right here, I want you guys to notice all the features. So look at the top of its head. Look inside the mouth. And I want you guys to look at the underside of this tail. So the underside is right there on the left hand side. Oh, you can see it a little better right there. So notice the plates. on the underside of the tail. So these guys are common down here in the South as well. These snakes are preserved in a kerosafe, basically um, the same thing that formaldehyde does. It kind of preserves them from rotting away. So we're gonna go to the next poll question <clears throat> and you guys are gonna tell me whether this snake is venomous or non-venomous. So I'm gonna let you guys look at him again or her. This one's a little bit more obvious than, uh, than the gray ribbon snake. There we go. Now you can see the scales on the bottom. Awesome. So the majority of you guys voted a venomous snake. So you guys are absolutely right. Um, it is a venomous snake. While I'm explaining why, um, go ahead and put in the chat whether you know what type of snake it is. So first thing we're going to look at is inside the mouth. Okay, so inside the mouth, we can see that there's tiny little fangs right there. So one fang on that side, another fang on the other side. So these guys have fangs. That's the first characteristic that this guy is venomous. Um, remember, that's where they inject the venom is through their fangs. So non-venomous snakes don't have any fangs. Second thing we're gonna look at 
is the top of the head. Well, oh, swimming around in there. <laughs> is the top of the head. So you can see that it's triangle shaped right here. See it's triangle shaped. Um, kind of looks like an arrowhead. And then the last thing is that the underside of their tail is single patterned scales. So you can see that there's single scales back to back to back to back. So with our, our uh, with these characteristics, they're not always 100% true. So we can have venomous snakes that have characteristics of non-venomous snakes and vice versa. So what I mean by that is um, sometimes we'll have venomous snakes that have a roundish shaped head and we'll have venom, uh, non-venomous snakes that have a triangle shaped head. So um, some characteristics aren't 100% true, but with the majority of the snakes, these um, characteristics do um, are true. So now I have one last organism and you guys are going to answer this. So this is the bonus round. So we have this guy right here. Top of the head is kind of skinny. So this guy is found on land, it's not an eel. Look at the underside of the tail. Right here, that's the tip of the tail. So that's uh, kind of a hint for y'all, for those who know what this is. Okay, so um, let's go back real quick. This is a uh, cotton mouth snake. So I see one of y'all got it right. This is a cotton mouth snake. That's awesome. So cotton mouth snakes are very venomous. You do not want to mess with them. Now, you guys are going to tell me whether this snake is venomous or non-venomous. So I'll show you all the head again. Really cool looking guy, looking right at you. That is where the tail is. All right, so we're split. We have people that think it's venomous and we have people that think it's non-venomous. So this was actually a trick question because this is not a snake, okay? This is what we call a legless lizard, a legless lizard. So these guys, they look like snakes, but they're not categorized as snakes um, for three reasons. And I'm gonna explain it why. So the first reason is that they have an ear hole. So right there, that little dot, those are ear holes. So snakes do not have ear holes. Um, so that's, that's one reason why they're not the same. The second reason is that you can't really see this part, but they can't unclench their jaw. So lizards can't unclench their jaw. If you've ever seen a snake eat something, they kind of open their mouth. So this is a snake mouth, right? In order to fit the food, because they like to eat organisms as a whole, they'll open their mouth and then they'll unclench their jaw. So that way they can push food down. With humans, we can't unclench their jaw, our jaws and neither can these legless lizards. So we can just eat whatever we can. We chew on everything. 
um, so that way it'll fit down our throats. But again, snakes can open their mouth and then unclench their jaw so that way they can fit more food down their stomach. And the last reason why this is not a snake is the tail. So if you've ever picked up a lizard, um, the first thing that happens most of the time is that their tail falls off. Um, and then it kind of just like wiggles around all over the place. Um, same thing happens with these guys. So these, this guy lost its tail and whenever it was caught, it was actually in the middle of growing it back. So it takes about a year to grow six inches. And that right there, you see how it's a different color. It's like, this is like the, the snake or not the snake, oops, the lizard's body. And then this is the tail growing out. So it's really cool that we were actually able to see this organism growing its tail out. So um, this is a glass legless lizard. These guys, um, whenever pioneers first came this way, they picked it up because it didn't really look menacing. It was just kind of minding its own business. And they picked it up and its tail fell off. So they named it glass lizard because it's as fragile as glass. All right, so we have one question that says, is a venomous snake killed? So it's not alive right now. Um, again, it was donated to us. So we did not go out and um, hunt for snakes. It was a donation. Someone probably just had it and, or found it already dead or something like that. Um, can venomous snakes have rounded eyes like non-venomous? Um, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, uh, like I said before, we will have venomous snakes that have non-venomous snake features and vice versa. So that's not 100% true, but the majority of these characteristics are in fact um, true. Okay, and then a bird <laughs> once dropped a snake in my backyard, that's crazy. It was probably like an eagle or an osprey or something. Okay. So now we're gonna talk about um, we're gonna talk about our turtles. So this is my favorite part. So, right here we have a green sea turtle skull. So it's almost as big as my head. Green sea turtle skull. And then this is a detachable beak. So it's not detachable when they're alive, but we were able to collect this um, skull with its beak still attached. So um, right here, we have the bottom part of the skull. Again, it's detachable. So this is the bottom part of the jaw. And at some point it was connected and it was able to eat that way. So the reason why these guys have beaks and not um, not really like teeth like humans do, is because they're scraping algae off of coral. Um, and they're eating seaweed and they're eating other vegetation. So they don't really need teeth because uh, it's just not really required for them to, to scrape off coral and stuff like that. So it's really interesting. Um, the reason why these guys are called, uh, called green sea turtles is because their fat turns green. So in plants, we have this thing called chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is basically what helps plants photosynthesize. So for those who don't know what photosynthesis is, 
That's basically when plants absorb uh, the sunlight and they use water to create food for themselves and release out oxygen. So they take in carbon dioxide, sun and water, and they make food for themselves as well as oxygen for us. So chlorophyll helps in that process. So whenever our green sea turtles eat, all these plants are consuming chlorophyll. And for some reason, they're able to, um, I guess, absorb this chlorophyll a lot better than other organisms. So we've have, we have a lots of herbivores. So herbivores are animals that eat plants. We have lots of herbivores out here in the world and they eat so many plants, but their fat doesn't necessarily turn green. Fat is usually like white, yellowish, um, but these guys are able to absorb this chlorophyll so much that their fat turns green. So it's really unique with these green sea turtles. Next one we're gonna show you is this loggerhead sea turtle. So this one's a lot bigger than the last one I showed you. That's where the eyes go. And then this is where the nostrils are. And then right here, we have, that's where the brain goes. So right here, really small, just like our alligators. So again, all reptiles are instinctual animals. And then right here, this is just connective muscle tissue um, that connects to the rest of their body out this way. So these guys have the second largest head, um, but have, I'm sorry, they have the largest head, but they have the second largest body. The largest sea turtle is a leatherback sea turtle. So those are commonly found in Australia. They can be almost the size of a Mini Cooper car. So if you've ever seen a Mini Coop, um, just think about a leatherback sea turtle. So leatherback sea turtles don't have a hard shell um, like the rest of the turtles. Their shell is basically consisted of leather. So um, it's really, really thick. It's about six inches thick. So that it can actually be more protective than having a hard shell, which is interesting. And this guy, this is the last skull we have. This is a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. So these guys are super small. You'll find them all over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they're actually the rarest sea turtle, um, but that's not necessarily a good thing. So whenever you think about rare, think about like gold and diamonds and stuff like that, that's valuable. But these guys are actually, there's only about a thousand of these Kemp's Ridley sea turtles left. Um, and they just, they're basically, uh, they're dying off for many reasons. So one being pollution, um, two, they're a really easy snack. So, I mean, a shark could eat this whole turtle in one bite or maybe two bites, depending on what size the shark is. So it's, it's really sad. And then the last thing is that they're getting caught in fisherman lines. So the majority of the time, it's not on purpose. Fishermen are not trying to kill sea turtles, but they, sometimes they do end up getting caught in their, their lines, which is kind of unfortunate because by the time they scoop up that net with all the fish, sometimes since these guys are, they have to breathe air, they have lungs, sometimes they suffocate under all that pressure or they don't make it by the time they get thrown back into the water. I'm gonna show y'all some more bone bones. Okay, so here we have sea turtle ribs. So these are really cool to look at. These are two ribs, two plates. Um, so if you've ever ate, you know, baby back ribs or anything like that, usually they don't have all this extra bone material in between each rib. Usually it's just muscle. But again, um, sea turtles don't have a way to protect themselves. Their limbs, so their flippers and the legs are exposed at all times. So they have to protect themselves 
and they have to put more armor wherever they can. So they put, they re, uh, restructure their ribs that way. It's really cool. Okay. And now we have this guy right here. Let me set back. This is a giant, uh, a giant shell. So I want you to put in the chat box whether turtles can live without a shell. So can they live without a shell? Can turtles, all turtles in general, are there species of turtles that can live without their shell? You guys say yes or no. Okay, so um, the correct answer is no, they cannot live without shells. Um, no matter what species of turtle it is, they cannot live without their shell. The reason for that is because their spine is directly attached to their shell. So you see right in the middle, this is the spine. So if you rip off the turtle shell, you rip off the spine. And organisms can't live without the spine. That's where the uh, nervous system is. That's what keeps the organism upright, um, basically from you know being upright to like a pile laying on the floor, pile of mush. So turtles need their shells. Even if, if we had the best surgeons in the world to try to take off the shell without her, um, hurting the spine, it would be impossible. Um, so yeah, so now you know, they can't live without shells. Okay, so the next guy we're gonna show you is this one right here. So this is an adult hawksbill sea turtle. So this is an actual sea turtle that was poached at some point in its life and then he was stuffed. So just like uh, people, um, they stuff or they use taxidermy on deer heads or anything they've hunted, the same thing happened to this guy right here. So everything is real except the eyes. So the eyes are made out of glass or marble. You can see the beak. So that's why they're called hawksbill, hawksbill sea turtles. And then there's shells right there. So this is a really cool um, full size adult. So you can see the flippers, you can see the bottom part of the shell, the little tail at the bottom. It's a really cool, fascinating creatures. And then here we have a juvenile hawksbill sea turtle. So whenever their babies are about this big, these are the baby size, and this is a juvenile size. So this is about uh, maybe 10, 15 years around there. So again, same characteristics. You got the little tail, legs, flippers right here. Um, the beak, really cool. The, uh, the eyes are made out of glass. So that's the only thing that's not real. The eyes will basically decompose over time. So um, that's the only thing that you can preserve. And then the shell is the reason why these guys are being poached. So they have really cool looking shells. Um, so poachers basically try to find these animals for their shells. So that way they can make jewelry and pendants and necklaces and stuff like that using this material. Don't know why they, why they do it. You can just get a printing press and print out the same pattern, but 
in other parts of the world, um, they're, either their laws aren't as strict or they just don't really care as much about preserving these sea turtles. So unfortunately, these guys are getting poached for their shells. All right, let's see. So are we gonna see your tortoise? So um, my tortoise was actually in the middle of a bath. It takes, he has to soak up for 20 minutes and I had to leave the house. So I'm actually at the MEC right now. Um, I promise, I promise you guys that I will show you all my tortoise on Thursday. I'm gonna be teaching about plant identification, um, but I will also show you my tortoise and we'll talk all about him so you guys can see him and see how he like walks around and stuff like that. What is the most endangered turtle? Um, I'm pretty sure it's the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle um, because they're super small and they're getting, you know, in the Gulf, there's always fishing, there's always pollution. Um, so there's lots of things that are affecting that turtle negatively. How long can turtles live? So that's a good question. Um, it depends on the species, first of all. So, and it also depends on the turtle. So terrapins don't live as long as our tortoises do. Terrapins, they can get up to 20, 30 years, um, maybe more at some times. Our sea turtles can live more than that. They can go, you know, 30, 40. Um, and then we have tortoises. Tortoises are the ones that live the longest. They can um, go anywhere from 80 years to 200, 300, um, you know, Right now, the Galapagos tortoises can live up to 300 years. Um, so that's really crazy to think of that they can live that long. That's at least like six, maybe seven generations of your family. So your great, 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 great grandpa was like alive whenever the tortoises were babies. So that's crazy to think of. So how many eggs can turtles lay at once? So that also depends on the species. So, I mean, it could be anywhere from 10 to 80 plus, um, depends on the species. So sea turtles, tortoises, and terrapins are, even though they're all turtles, they're all very different in those, uh, in that sense. Then how many Galapagos tortoises are there? That's a good question. I'm honestly not 100% sure. We can look it up and see. I know that the numbers aren't, um, there aren't that many. Let's look it up though. They're actually on the endangered list. So that's uh, another turtle that is endangered. The majority of the turtles are endangered just because they're just, they don't really have any defense mechanisms. Um, they're really slow, they're really bulky. Um, you know, it's, it's a really easy target for predators and even ants and other microorganisms will attack these, these turtles. All right, so while that answer is loading, I'm gonna show y'all um, our terrapins. All right, so the first one we have, this is a soft shelled terrapin. So their shell you can see is decomposing and that's why it's really flimsy, not as hard. Um, and that's why it has this weird shape. So they don't put as much uh, keratin into their shells and that's why it's kind of just decomposing over time. So soft shells, soft shell turtles, um, you can see them, they have them at Dolphin Island uh, estuarium. So if you've ever been that way, they do have some soft shell turtles on display. They're really interesting. They have really cool little snouts. Right here, we have an example of a box turtle. 
So this is your common box turtle. This is what, what you'll find all over the South. Again, the spine right in the middle. This is a full size box turtle. So you don't really get bigger than this. This is just their shell. So you'll have a little head sticking out. You find these all over the South, crossing the road and rivers, lakes. All right, and then right here, we have an alligator snapping turtle shell. So this is just a uh, average looking uh, shell, but these guys can get really, really big, weigh 200 pounds easy. Um, they can have really large spikes on their shells. So this one, you can kind of see, it's a little bit dulled down, but they can have really large spikes and these guys are the ones you wanna avoid at all costs. Um, they're called alligator snapping turtles for a reason. So they can easily bite off a finger. There's been incidents reported of alligator snapping turtles biting off fingers when one clean snap. Um, one time I tried to help an alligator snapping turtle cross the road and the way it repaid me was it tried to bite me. Um, and then at that point, I was really interested in see like how strong their bite force is. So I grabbed a stick and it was about the size of a broom, like a broomstick. So really, really thick. Um, and I put it right in front of its mouth and it chopped it with one bite, just broke it straight in half. So it's really crazy that, that these guys can do that. They have little tongues, like little pink tongues that they stick out of their mouth. And they use that kind of like fishing. So they use that as a lure or bait and fish will think that it's food. You know, it's like a little worm or something like that. And we'll get close to it. And whenever the alligator thinks, the alligator snapping turtle thinks it's the right time, it'll chomp on it and eat the fish whole. So that's really crazy to think of. All right, so let's see, the saltwater crocs have enough jaw power to bite through a turtle shell. Absolutely, absolutely. Why do all turtles and tortoises have different patterns on their shell? So it just, it, it depends on um, several things. It could be genetics. It could be um, what type of, of turtle it is. Um, and they're also like fingerprints, you know, everyone has a different fingerprint and different patterns, you know? Like I said, I have moles in different parts of my face. Not everyone has these moles. Um, so it's kind of like their signature mark. Did you know you can read, you can learn about turtles and more on, in who would win books? Cool, I did not know that. I'll have to look into that. And then what is the longest living terrapin? So let's Google this real quick and answer the last question too. Um, So there's about um, um, there's there's about a thousand to two thousand Galapagos turtles left in the world, so not that many. And then the other question is. Um, so it says that they can live up to 50 years. That's the oldest terrapin. According to Google. So let's see if we have any more questions. What's the strongest thing that an alligator snapping turtle can bite? Um, honestly, probably a large stick 
large branch. That's uh, it's really hard to break those. Um, I personally probably wouldn't have been able to break that branch that or that stick that I had the alligator snapping turtle bite. So that just shows that they're a lot stronger <laughs> than that. Most endangered terrapin. Wow, you guys are asking asking excellent questions. So there's actually a few terrapins that are endangered. Um, we have the North River terrapin. That one looks like it has a red body and a black um, face. We have the painted ter terrapin, Southern River terrapin, um, the red crowned roof turtle. And there's actually about 11 critically endangered turtles or terrapins. Awesome. So you guys asked me a lot of cool questions. I'm always learning about these guys. Reptiles have so many unique features and they're so, uh, they're so different than mammals are. So, all right. So if you don't have any more questions, make sure to tune in tomorrow at nine o'clock. Um, Lacey's going to be talking about arthropods and then she has a really cool lesson at 11 as well. Um, and then after that Thursday, um, I'll bring by my tortoise. So please remind me and, um, I'll definitely show you all my tortoise after I'm done talking about plants. And then again, Lacey has a really cool lesson at 11. And then our final lesson is meteorology on Friday and, uh, at nine and 11. So make sure to tune in this week and please remind me about my tortoise so I can show you guys. He's awesome. He's a really cool pet. Um, he's really easy to take care of. So if you can convince your parents to get a tortoise, that would be awesome. All right. So I'm going to sign off. I'll see y'all tomorrow.